Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, uh, Monday, the 15th of February, uh, the day after Valentine's Day. So we've all survived Valentine's Day. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, say that uh, this morning we're having a chat um, with uh, one of my nominated mayoral charities for this year, um, being the Samaritans. Um, very, very pleased to say that Susanna Fenton uh, and Alistair Martin of the Samaritans are with us. I, I think Alistair may be putting some slides up on the screen um, uh, that will provoke conversation, hopefully. Um, and um, I think um, the only thing I'd just say before Alistair does do that is that, of course, we are immensely grateful to the Samaritans for all the incredibly valuable work that you do. Um, and perhaps I might also say as a male, then I believe I'm right to say, but Susanna and Alistair no doubt can develop this, uh, that um, uh, there is uh, a challenging rate of suicide among uh, the male population, if not the younger male population. Uh, and by that, I don't at all mean to um, um, segregate between difficulties that males find themselves in and females find themselves in, uh, but it is important to remember that it affects everyone in society. So the work that the Samaritans do is very, very valuable. And we're very glad that Susanna and Alistair are joining us this morning. So with that, Alistair, uh, if, you've, uh, if you've got a slide or two you want to put up on the screen and uh, provoke conversation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. A couple of moments while I do the share screen thing. Hi, so I, I'm Susanna and I'm the uh, branch director at WARE. So we, we've got about, we vary, um, but it's currently about 170 volunteers there and we have a team of us who lead the branch. Um, but I should say we are all volunteers, um, every single one of us. We don't have a single paid um, member of staff there. And our former director used to say the only person who gets paid is the window cleaner so that that's um that's as far as it goes so so what we do over there what, the reason we do it um you can see up on the screen is that that our vision as an organization is that fewer people die by suicide so that's that's why we're here that's what we're set up to do and we were set up um about 60 years ago by um a, a, a vicar called chad vara um who saw the need for people to not just talk, but what's really important is that um, when they talk, they're listened to. And that, that was what he saw all those years ago and what sparked the organisation originally, that, that people need to be listened to. So you can see up on that screen some of the statistics um, about the branch. What I always find interesting on there is that we respond to a call for help every seven seconds, um, which is incredible. Actually, when you think about it, it's an incredible demand for the service. Um, the, the, the We've got here something from Alistair, which is about the experience of a caller and so what a caller thinks about when when they call is they're saying I know there'll be someone there to listen someone to say you're doing all right and who won't judge me so was it going back there to, to what we do we listen and it's, it doesn't sound like rocket science does it listening it's um but it it's amazing I suppose in life how often people aren't listened to um and how that impacts them on their life so what they will always find when they call Samaritans is that they will have somebody who will listen to them that will give them time and who won't judge them no no matter what their issue is in life they, they are not going to receive any judgment from the person on the other end of the phone we're not, um, we're not an advice line I think it's important to say we don't give people advice we don't know their stories well enough you can't find out their stories enough um, in a phone call to give them advice uh, you might be telling them you know, entirely inappropriate advice so sometimes we do signpost people to more expert organisations but as Susanna said um, we, we're just there to listen and am I, am I right Alistair and Susanna um, that when somebody phones in 
the, the call from their point of view is completely anonymous. They're not required to identify themselves or anything like that. They just phone and you listen. Yeah, ab absolutely that. So, so I mean, it's a very clever system whereby um, the call calls and emails come through to us. We can't identify at all, even where somebody is in the country. We, we know nothing. So when somebody calls us, we just hear a voice on the end of the phone and the only information we will ever have about that person is what they tell us if they choose to tell us so we will actually often have you know you can speak to somebody for an hour or more and not know their name and it it seems quite strange you know and we're allowed to have had such a long conversation with somebody in such a an in-depth and personal conversation with somebody and yet you don't know where they're from you you, you know you won't speak to them again and you don't even know their name. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. It's, it's, um, Does that mean then in the case of the of our local branch, which happens to be located in where, um, uh, that you might receive calls from all over the country or is there a filter such that you receive calls from more local people? No, so we used to have a, um, a local number that people could use as a, as a local call, but um, we changed to a free phone number several years ago and so because the free phone number is centrally organized it's actually now the calls can be directed anywhere so you can be sitting in where taking a call from somebody in Aberdeen um it it, it you really don't know where somebody might have come from um, same with emails we we have emails from all over it you know it doesn't matter they come from the one thing that I, um, I guess is is particularly um, for local people is we do do face-to-face -face visits as well in normal times so um, local people can come and you can see on that slide there that's our building in where so we're, we're in the middle of a residential street and that's very deliberate that we're in a residential street because we want to feel like we're in the heart of the community um, and in normal times people can come to the door ring at the door and just say I, I need to talk to somebody and um, they can come in and talk to a Samaritan um, but Sadly, coronavirus has put paid to that for the moment, but it is something that we do normally offer and um, we feel is very important. So in normal times, how many people, how many Samaritans are there in the, your, um, your office? Uh, at one time? Yes, at one time. It, it, it can vary. We always have a minimum of two people on the phone lines because we always... One of the very important things about Samaritans for, for the volunteers themselves is that we obviously have to support each other because we do take difficult calls and we do hear difficult things. And so we need to make sure we're there for each other. So there is a rule that we will never, ever be on duty on our own. So there's always at least two. Um, we have the capacity to have four on duty at any time. And that's 24 seven. So we are there through the night as well. Um, at the moment, we've had to adapt the branch. So we, we've stayed open throughout coronavirus. We've, we've never closed. Um, and we've been able to do that because we've made adaptations to the way that we work. So the way that we work at the moment is such that we are socially distanced. Everything is clean. So it's, it's, it's different now. Um, we're looking at ways to try to get more people into the building by using our training room. So we have some space in our training room, which we're going to try and use operationally as well. So um, we're looking at it all the time to try and keep as many volunteers on duty as we can. And on the on the 24 seven thing, does mm -hmm. that mean that you've got, uh, I don't know, bunk beds or something in, in the office or is the uh, idea that if you're doing no. a shift, you've got to be fully awake all the time? No, we all, ordinarily, we do have to be fully awake all of the time. The, the lines don't stop ringing. Um, so the way we work is we, we the calls come in, we, we can see on a dashboard how many callers are waiting. Um, and I would say, Alice, do you think this is right? It's once in a blue moon, if less frequently than that, that there isn't somebody waiting to. So when you, on, yeah. the, system we have, on the system we have in the office, um, you, you, you end a call, you, you maybe log it, you maybe talk about it to your, Cohorts here, and then when you're ready to take another call, as soon as you hit the button to take another call, the phone rings, whatever time of day or night it is. So the so the the flow of calls is basically incessant, non-stop. Yeah. You put the phone down, it rings again. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 
and it's particularly so throughout the night, actually. Um, well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So uh, it, uh, although our um, calls could come from anywhere, I think it's just important to say that we are, um, and we'll talk later about our work in the community, um, but we are an independent local charity. Um, we're affiliated to the national body, um, but we we kind of we have to we have to um, keep ourselves on our feet. We raise our own funds to stay open, um, and rather than getting money from the national charity, it's kind of the other way around. We contribute to keeping them going. How many, um, if I could ask, and don't don't respond if it's inappropriate. How many volunteers do you have? Uh, that um, operate from the Ware branch? Um, it, I think we've got, I, I checked for the presentation a couple of days ago, and we've got 172 volunteers at the moment. Not all of them are listening volunteers. We have some support volunteers as well who help us with things like um, fundraising and IT. So yeah, around 170 people involved in the branch. And is that, if I may say, is that enough? Or do you have almost a, a, an endless requirement, given, given that the phone rings all the time? Um, nationally, um, the charity has its, um, not speaking out of turn, capacity problems. We do need many more volunteers. Um, the, the bottleneck, and it's the slight bottleneck for us, we have um, a long waiting list of volunteers at the moment. Um, the issue is getting everybody trained. Um, it takes about 120 hours to train a new volunteer over a period of time. Um, so yeah, we need we need more people. And the issue is is being able to train them all. Yeah, and I think the conundrum for us has been over the past year. Um, so normally, training is delivered face to face over a series of evenings in the branch, and of course with coronavirus we've had to stop that um, nationally the the training has now been adapted so that we can deliver it online and so we have started with a group in January who were receiving their training online um, but there has been a break and um, because of that the, there's been two things that have happened really in the last year the first is that we we didn't train our April or September groups last year because we weren't able to um, we're now in a position that we can do the online training. So we've got a backlog of two groups, but also within that time, more people have looked to volunteer. So it's a really frustrating situation actually, because we, we don't have enough people to answer all of the calls, but it's quite difficult to get people through because the training is in, it's intense. It's, it's really, really good. Um, you know, it, it changes your life, Alistair, I think it's fair to say, isn't it? Change, it does change your life. The training makes you different. Um, and it, it, it's great, but, you know, the sort of course we're going to take, you have to be well-trained. And so we can't skip that. We can't make that any shorter. So it, it is frustrating. We're trying to do what we can to get as many people through as we can. At the so moment. just say again, how long is the training? Um, well, it takes place over... At, to be comfortably or, or, trained, it takes about six to eight times. months. In ordinary times, how long is the training? It should take about six to eight months. Yeah, it's just quite a lot of time, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And some of that is face to face training, some of that is being mentored um, on actual shifts. There's two parts to the training we have initial training, and then we start mentored shifts, and then we have a further piece of training, bringing it all together once we've had some experience of actually taking calls. So it's. Uh, it's good and it prepares our volunteers really well, but it it's necessarily time consuming and therefore um, we can't get people through more quickly than we are, um, sadly. We'd like to. <laughs> and any, any bright ideas on that are gratefully received. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> so. But I mean, it's obviously very special training, isn't it? Clearly, yeah. it's a special... I think particularly... When you say, uh, and I think anybody that knows a little bit about the Samaritans does know this, particularly when you say that you listen mm. uh, uh, and you might have to listen for quite a long time. 
I mean, that in itself is a skill, isn't it? And yeah. um, if you're listening to somebody that's in a degree of distress, that's quite, it's quite challenging. Yes. Yes, it can be challenging. And long calls can be very challenging and tiring, actually, as well. It's, you know, it's tiring to be on the phone for a long time for the caller as well. You know, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you're not allowed, am I right, just, just a curse, you're, you're not allowed to say to somebody, um, look, you know, we've had a really nice chat here, um, uh, but if, and if you give me your number, I'll give you a call back tomorrow just to make, you can't do that, can you? Yeah, we can as an organisation call them back. So we can offer what's called a follow-up call, where in a situation where we think somebody would benefit from a call following day, but that wouldn't be the same volunteer. That would be a different volunteer. So yes, you, you would very rarely unless just it happened by chance ever speak to the same person twice bob you were talking earlier or asking earlier about the scale of the problem and, and there's some numbers there that um, shows and you're right about um, men under 50 and you're right about young people um, three courses of deaths by suicide are men yeah. And we're also seeing an increase in self-harming at the moment. Those uh, statistics are really very powerful, aren't they? Yeah. Very powerful. But if I might say, um, uh, the uh, simple number of uh, deaths in 2018, uh, I'm, ass I'm, I'm assuming that that is significantly in excess of the number of um, road accident deaths in a year. Mm -hmm. is, is that right, do you happen to know? I'm just looking at perspective, you see. I suspect that, you know, we, mm -hmm. as, as a society, we do make quite a lot of fuss, don't we, about um, driving properly and being mm -hmm. safe on the roads and things like that. Um, but um, suicide is just an enormous, enormous problem. Yes. Yeah, it is. And obviously, we, you know, we've had coronavirus impacting us all, um, you know, for the last 12 months. And, and we don't just talk to people who are suicidal. You know, some of our calls are people who are suicide, but we also talk to people who are just struggling, you know, just struggling with the way things have been. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, we're all impacted, aren't we? Everybody is impacted by by what's gone on. The, you know, they're challenge, challenging times. Is there, is, there, is there any sense of the age profile of callers into you? Do you get callers? I mean, I imagine you don't get very young callers, but do you get, say, teenage callers? Do you know? Yeah. Can you tell? You do? Yeah. yeah. Going to university is quite a big trigger because people are away from all of their support networks for the first time they're away from family school and friends um, and i would imagine you might have had more of those calls during the coronavirus period because it seems to me that the university thing now is rather stressful for young people yeah, yeah i think i think um i think the thing about the coronavirus is it, it, it i think what you find with calls is that the calls aren't necessarily about coronavirus itself but it exacerbates problems that people already have. So, you know, if, if they're feeling lonely, you know, perhaps they're feeling even lonelier. Um, and if they're struggling at uni, perhaps they're struggling a bit more at the moment. Um, so it's, I've, just, I've just done some very simple arithmetic. If yeah. you're receiving 35,000 contacts a year, mm. Am I right? That's a hundred every day mm -hmm. in round figures. Every day, hundred. That's quite a lot. Yeah. And of course, that's phone call or message. When and the the message is that we I mentioned before we do email, so we have an email service as well. Um, and what we have during coronavirus that we've been a pilot branch for online chat. So this is a new service that's being introduced nationally. Um, to reach people who perhaps don't want to pick up the phone, can't pick up the phone yeah. for whatever reason, um, for whom it is much 
better to be able to just sit and type. Um, and we we were at the first ever um, uh, shift for that in September. Um, and we continue to do that. So it's still in its pilot stages. So it's not available 24 seven yet. Um, but that's a really interesting development as well. Um, it really seems as though we are reaching people. We're definitely reaching people that we weren't reaching before. So they will be added into the contacts too. So we, we have the phone calls, we have the emails, we have obviously the face-to-face -face in normal times, and now we've got the online chat as well. So um, and again, yeah, 800 contacts is probably about right, yeah. yeah so that it, for, it, for every day, mm. every day of the year, that is, I think, a lot of contact. It's a lot of contact. And it is every day as well. It's Christmas Day, it's Easter Sunday, it's New Year's Day, it's every day and every night. I think, um, Bob, it might be interesting to, to know about the work we do locally. Again, uh, yeah. uh, the calls could come from anywhere, but um, we, we have a, an outreach team that goes out into Hartford and the surrounding community. And last year we had 32,000 contacts with people in the community, including um, some year fives, I think, called Crucial Crew. Uh, I think is organised by county where we um, talk to children. Well, we basically we play a game with them that enc encourages them to believe that it's um, safe and okay to talk if they've, they've got a problem. So we, we kind of start early on the basis that if we can get out into the community, um, we can stop an issue becoming a problem and we can stop a problem becoming a crisis. So you go into schools to do that, do you? Yeah. Well, the, the actual crucial group happens um, in centres. So I mean, it happens at Morgan School when we're in Hartford. So we'll go to Morgan School. They host it. Um, it happens at the university. It happens at the college in Turnford. Um, so we'll we'll turn up to that. And, and we're one scenario of about 10. So there'll be different, um, different people there, like the police do a scenario, um, the fire service do a scenario. Um, so we do that, but we also do do workshops in schools. We will go into schools. Um, we do work workshops. We do talks. Um, we do quite a lot of work with the university at Hatfield, um, both with the staff and with the students. So, yeah, so qu quite a lot of work in, in educational establishments. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? It does seem to me that um, in this coronavirus period, there have been a lot of um, stresses and anxieties that uh, that we've not previously had to had to cope with. Um, you know, as I've already mentioned, I think uh, I can I have huge sympathy for young people heading off to university now. It's a completely different situation than they were expecting. Yeah. Huge sympathy with young people taking exams for which they prepared, um, and you know, they don't quite know what's going to happen. I think the teaching profession. Um, uh, are actually frontline workers, which isn't, in my opinion, quite recognised maybe as much as it should be. And then, of course, you've got all the, the obvious frontline workers, all the NHS people. Um, I happen to have my vaccination on Saturday morning. Oh, right. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, you, you know, the, the, the effort, um, and it, that's, that's putting it mildly, isn't it? The, the huge, massive contribution that all sorts of people have made to... Um, or at least keeping the country running in the last 12 months is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, I would think that, um, well, we're all very grateful that you're there to help us. I think it's yeah, also, uh, quite, quite early on, um, Samaritans um, and Shout, which is a text service, um, and mine set up a special dedicated line for frontline workers it's it's a it's a private line that um, people working on the front line can access um, and we've had volunteers um, working on that line as well yeah. and another big part of our outreach locally is working with network rail at stations in the area yes yes i have i must say speaking personally i uh, was for quite a long time a commuter a train commuter and uh, because i was doing it for a long time i did did notice the arrival of Samaritan signs at train stations. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just so good. It's very, very good. Um, and just so we don't gloss over it, I, I think I caught you saying just now that um, you 
you've uh, helped 32,000 local people. In, that's in that's um, contacts. So that's, um, yeah. you know, if we get our number out there by giving someone a card, then that's, you know, yeah. getting our reach out into the, into the community. Good. It's not, it's not 32,000 conversations. A lot of them are conversations, but not all of them are. No, 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 but there's, it's contacts. I and mean, I think the word's yeah. perfectly, perfectly yeah. fine word. Okay, Alistair, have you got any more interesting slides to show us? <laughs> so let's look at this. Yeah, so, so fund rates, so as we said before, we, we have to raise our own funds for our operating costs. And we have a fantastic group called the Friends, um, of where Samaritans who fundraise for us, who've obviously, you know, they, they do things like shaking tins for us. They go to Brookfield Centre um, and shake tins for us and they organise quizzes. Um, none of that has happened this year. Uh, so it's been challenging. Now we have been, you know, fortunate in that we've been able to get some grant funding that wouldn't normally be available to cover some of the deficit. But I think... I think we're all quite aware that the next year or however many years could be quite challenging financially. So we, you know, we don't know how far we're going to have to make that stretch. So it says their annual operating costs are about twenty six thousand pounds. Tend to vary between about twenty six and thirty thousand pounds, depending on what um, what expenditure we've had in a given year. So normally our friends would raise a, a good amount of that. Last year they gave us a check for twelve thousand pounds. Um, Alistair, you might want to explain the. Yes, I think it's worth figures. saying that we 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 think we I don't know, we think that um, our, our money goes a long way compared to a lot of other charities. Um, there's a national lottery um, heritage fund guidelines that helps you make bids to the to the lottery, and using those calculations. Um, every pound we raise becomes 30, 35 pounds worth of value given. And that's because everybody's a volunteer. Yeah. We're not paying salaries. We've not got salaries to pay. So a pound donated to Samaritans goes, goes a long way. Yeah. So that, that's an important point in itself, isn't it? That you are, all of you, volunteers. Yeah. I think that's quite profound. And um, you're all volunteering to do something which is not that easy it seems to me and i think that's very very creditable so um people can help um bob obviously you've made us your mayoral charity of the year and that's that's fantastic and people can support your fundraising on our behalf um i know you did the christmas carols which you very kindly let us participate on um, on our website, which you can find on Samaritans Where, you can find our donate button there. Um, there's a text to donate. Um, and a lot of people are doing their own. Oh, I think Alistair's frozen. Um, yeah, Alistair, you're frozen. Yeah, I think Alistair's frozen. People can ask him, their, their bosses, their clubs, or organisations to. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, I think Alistair yeah. and Susanna. I think this. Um, Am I back? Yeah, right, you're there. We can. Yeah. We can see you, see you and hear you. I think myself. This is a an important part of our conversation this morning, because um, as you rightly say, as the mayor, I, I'm in a position to nominate charities, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, in a normal year. Um, there are a series, as I think you both know, there are a series of um, traditional functions that occur throughout the year, um, uh, a lot of which uh, are designed to raise money for the mayor's charities. Um, and this year, we've not been able to have any of those <laughs> events. Um, so the truth of it is that it's been uh, really difficult for uh, me as the mayor, for Hartford Town Council, to raise money. And I, I'm very keen uh, that uh, anybody that uh, is viewing this, um, this conversation really does understand that uh, I'm personally fully committed to the Samaritans um, 
it, of course, it's nobody's fault that we're stuck with coronavirus and it's nobody's fault that life is not normal. But for the Samaritans, life goes on. Uh, and we've heard this morning that you have 32,000 local contacts. Uh, you have 100 uh, contacts a day uh, in various different ways. Um, you deal with people on the telephone. You deal with people on email. Uh, you have the capacity in normal times to see people face to face. Um, and, um, and, and there's an immense need for what you do. So if I might say to um, those out there kind enough to be watching this, uh, if you are able to support the Samaritans, I, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that Hartford Town Council has now got a just giving uh, facility. Um, um, uh, so although clearly you can choose to give, if you can, to the Samaritans Direct, uh, you would now be able to uh, direct some uh, donations to the Samaritans through our Just Giving facility at Hartford Town Council. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, uh, if you feel able to contribute anything, I'd really encourage you to do it. I think if you just go back to the slide that Alistair's just taken off the screen, actually. Um, you're nearly there, Alistair. Sorry, Bob. That's okay. Can't tell whether I'm back in the room or not. It's the... Uh, I can't see the, that's it, that's it. If you just look at the bottom of that, that slide, look at that. Just five pounds would cover the cost involved in a call with somebody that might be desperately in need. And when we remember that the training programme for a new volunteer is quite lengthy and quite profound, and I think Alistair and Susanna have both said that uh, it's changed them as people, um, um, uh, 200 pounds really uh, to enable that for a new volunteer uh, is money it seems to me extremely well spent so uh, I do encourage people if they can to support the Samaritans either directly or through Hartford Town Council's Just Giving page I think that's probably enough from me I'll let Alistair and Susanna have the last word I think um Thank you, Bob. Um, I think the last word is just to say why it all matters now. Um, it's impacting all of our lives. Um, it's uncertain and challenging times. And um, Samaritans is at the moment needed now more than ever. Um, and so a donation can help us to do all the things we've, we've highlighted today. So thank you, Bob and Hartford Town Council for hosting us, Susanna. Yes, thank you. And I, I just wanted to say, just as a final thing, that, you know, if anybody is watching this and they are struggling and they do need somebody to talk to, please do remember that we're there and it's a free phone number. Um, our number is 116 123. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. You can call from a mobile with no credit. Um, that, that's the beauty of the, of the national number. So please, if you need us, we are there. And thank you for hosting us, Bob, today. No, you're very, very welcome, Susanna and Alistair. Thank you so much for everything that you do.